Hey everybody, Saul Marquez with the Outcomes Rocket. I want to welcome you back to the podcast. Today I have the privilege of having Liam Kaufman back on the podcast with us. He is the co-founder at Winterlight Labs. They develop digital biomarkers to quantify uh, cognitive impairment and mental health using speech and machine learning. Super excited about it. They were actually acquired by Cambridge Cognition this year in January. So very excited to have Liam back to talk about the work that they're up to. Liam, thanks for joining us again. My pleasure. Nice to be on Saul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great to have you. And so talk to us. What's new? Cambridge Cognition acquired you guys? Correct. Yeah. Um, my personal view is that over time, uh, payers, providers, pharmaceutical companies will be using multimodal methods for me measuring um, psychiatry and neurology. And so what that means is they won't just be using speech but they'll be using facial expressions, activity patterns, cognitive assessments to come up with more objective ways of, of quantifying neurology and psychiatry. And so part of our interest in being acquired was um, seeing this vision through, was being part of a bigger organization that had these additional measures to create something that's a more fuller offering. Well, congratulations on uh, getting closer to, to, to that mission. It's big. Liam, help us understand what you guys are working on and how you're adding value to the healthcare ecosystem. Yeah, for sure. So we started off by analyzing people's uh, voice and speech. And so typically people would either describe a picture or do any sort of task that creates a bit of speech, that elicits speech. And then we extract about 800 different characteristics from the sound to what they say, how they say it, syntax, grammar. And there tends to be patterns that are associated with different diseases. So when someone has Alzheimer's disease, they have trouble finding the right word. And so this might manifest in longer pauses. They might use more pronouns like he, she, it, because they can't think of the, the name of something or you know, the noun. Um, whereas for schizophrenia, people tend to be more incoherent. So they might jump around from topic to topic. And so why this is important um, is that pharma is interested in coming up with more objective ways of measuring whether their treatments are actually effective. And so in 2015, 2016, a lot of these pharma companies put together digital biomarker, digital health groups, uh, with the goal of coming up with better measures and, and, and better ways of, of determining if the drugs are effective. And so that was really the first way that we started working with companies. And then more recently, what we started to do is we've actually started to leverage existing assessments. Um, so for Alzheimer's disease, they have these laborious, uh, error prone assessments, some of them are called uh, ADAS COG, CDR, and they actually record people doing them. And then they have a human scored offline to make sure it was administered and scored correctly. Cause it's, it's, it's hard to administer and score. And we started to realize that we can actually leverage our existing technology stack to start to automate some of those things. And so not only can we provide new measures, we can also improve uh, existing measures. And so that's something that we just launched uh, about uh, two to three weeks ago. It's all about voice biomarkers, keywords to, to really understand if, if, uh, if a medication is, is helping, if it's advancing. How about on the detection side, Liam, is there, is there anything there on the, on the diagnosis side? We, we tended to focus on change over time, response to therapy, but there, there certainly is a signal early on um, that uh, you hear from um, anecdotal stories of, of loved ones, caregivers, et cetera, where they start to notice that someone is talking a bit different. Um, they're forgetting things, there's more pauses. So you do notice that. I think where the industry is probably heading though, um, especially with things like Alzheimer's disease, is probably a combination of blood-based biomarkers and more comprehensive uh, remote cognitive assessments. And so I think voice will be an important part of that, but I don't think it will be the only part of, of those solutions. As you sort of take a look at the horizon on some of these technologies, you know, what would you say uh, the voice biomarkers enable pharmaceutical companies to understand that maybe normal tests can't? Like what's different and what's better about them? Yeah, so I can give you some concrete examples with a normal cognitive assessment. Um, it takes about 45 minutes to administer. And so that's obviously uh, expensive. It's a burden on the patient. 
uh, and they don't just administer one of these, they tend to administer three, four or five of these. And so it, it can take a couple hours. We found that with about two minutes of speech, we can show similar changes over time as a 45 minute assessment. Um, and I think when you start to add a few extra minutes, you can start to capture some of the same different cognitive domains as these 45 minute assessments. And so in about five to 10 minutes, you can start to capture what previously took 45 minutes. And with these 45 minute assessments, as I alluded to before, uh, they tend to be error prone. And so they require a lot of training, but people still make small mistakes or big mistakes when they administer them. They make mistakes when they score them. And those mistakes can reduce the signal from the therapy. And so the idea here is to do this objectively and have a computer score a lot of these different measures. Um, it, it, one of the main outcome measures for Alzheimer's disease has a question where a clinician has to rate someone's word planning difficulties on a scale from zero to five. And that's really subjective. And if you can get a computer to do this, which we can do, you can come up with, again, 100% objective measures for things like word planning difficulties and, and other aspects of speech and language. These exams, right, apart from the amount of time that they take, do people actually have to go into an office? Because a lot of these things probably can't happen in the home, or are they happening in the home? That's a great point. So they are typically done in clinic. Um, and that's a huge burden for people if they live yeah. a couple hours away from um, a trial site. And so the idea here is that I think in the short term, there still will be in clinic uh, administration. But in addition to that, though, you can more easily test people remotely. And so you can use that remote data to augment um, that in clinic data. Yeah, this this topic of real world evidence, right? Like, and, and being able to gather that uh is 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 critical um and you know we're always looking for ways to reach more diverse uh uh you know data sets patient communities to be able to to make these drugs possible so i, I love the the opportunity that this opens up if you if you think about because you've been how long have you been doing this for liam like the the voice but yeah since about 2015 so you've been at it for a long time you were you were doing it before it was cool <laughs> yeah, that's what sure. I say about podcasting. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and so you've seen a lot of the ups and downs. What what would you say is one of the biggest setbacks you saw that, you know, maybe firm, f formed a really firm foundation for you guys in the work that you do? It was definitely COVID. Um, so pre-COVID, uh, we were exploring different business models. We were uh, doing a bit of work with, with pharma, we were doing a bit of work with senior care homes and we were talking to providers and payers. And then once COVID hit, all the pilots that we had with senior care homes evaporated overnight. Um, and so there was zero capacity to do any of that work. There wasn't a lot of interest. They had a pants on fire problem. And, and then all of a sudden, um, pharma, uh, had a lot more interest in like remote assessments, digital biomarkers, they had bigger budgets. Um, and so pretty much in a three to four month period, we pivoted to focusing hundred percent on pharma. Wow. Uh, and, and so our, our business really kind of exploded in 2021, I would say like the year after COVID started, uh, because of that wave of, of, of interest within pharma. Amazing. Yeah. And it's interesting, right? So you said before pharma, it was payers. Kind of targeting payers, or 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 maybe that mostly, I you? yeah, mostly a mix of senior care plus senior, uh, care. yeah, plus, plus pharma, yeah, senior care, got it. And then it just turned to pharma, and I mean the motivation, the acquisition models a lot faster, I imagine, as they're trying to get these these drugs to market. So what a blessing that that happened, and kudos to you guys for sort of seeing that right and and responding to it. Big challenge now is just the current market conditions. Um, and I think it's, it's an interesting time to be in digital health. Like it feels uh, a lot like the equivalent of, you know, 2000 for technology where you see all these bankruptcies, layoffs, et cetera. And it seems pretty grim, but I think a lot of the groundwork that these companies have done, I think will lead to real sustainable successes in the next few years. And so even though things aren't amazing right now, I think in a year or two from now, whether it's new regulatory pathways, new ways of reimbursements, monetization, et cetera. I think we're going to see some positive changes in the next few years. I agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you. I think now is the time 
if everyone in the business of digital health can stay strong and whether these next this next year or two, your business is going to be more lean, you're going to be more focused, you're going to be the strong ones on the block. So I uh, love that message, Liam. I totally love it. What well, what would you what would you say is one healthcare trend or technology that's going to change healthcare as we know it? Large language models like Chat GPT could have a huge impact. Um, there's a lot of work that doctors do that they don't like to do. And and I think people have tried to automate some of that stuff and reduce some of that. Um, but in the end, it seems like doctors just have more and more of that sort of quote unquote paperwork that they have to do. And so I think when you, you could start to automate it with things like chat GPT or other large language models, they won't happen quickly. Um, changes in healthcare don't happen quickly, but I think there is a chance for it to happen quicker when it starts to eat at a lot of that administrative work rather than d diagnostic or things that require uh, more evidence to uh, to solve. It, it is the thing, right? Everybody's talking about it. I think the the opportunity for you know large language models to to make an impact are huge, uh, and and it's only time will tell. And, and so, look, I, I I love to hear success stories. And I appreciate you jumping back on to to be one of those success stories, Liam. What closing thought would you leave for the listeners as we conclude today's episode? And and where can they find out more about you if if they're interested in in working with you guys on the pharma side? For sure. I mean, people can find out more about us on LinkedIn. We we typically post updates about new products and uh, research that we've done. Um, going back to an earlier comment that I made around things being kind of grim now. Um, again, I just want to re reiterate that I think, um, that a lot of companies like paratherapeutics, um, had a lot of hard work to do, to bring their, their therapies to market. And a lot of that hard work started to bear fruits in the last year or two before their bankruptcy. And I'm sure there was, there's a bunch of other, other companies in a similar situation. And so effectively those things didn't happen quick enough, um, and funding kind of ran out, but I think in the next year or two. Um, you'll see that'll be much harder or much easier to start an equivalent digital health or digital therapeutic company because the pathway has been created by all those companies that had to work incredibly hard um, to get to where they were. So even though they weren't necessarily financial successes, I think in many ways they were a success early trailblazers that will make it easier for the next generation of, of, of companies to be created in digital health. Yeah, no, good closing there, Liam. I, the the quote I've heard is pioneers get spears and you got to be strong to to withstand those. And the the, the path they've laid is strong. Uh, and and uh, I think giving them recognition it was was a good, good point there, Liam. Look, uh, uh, thank you again, right? Really appreciate you being with us on the podcast and uh, please uh, stay in touch. And folks, make sure you check out Liam and the company We'll leave every uh we'll leave a link to his LinkedIn inside of the show notes so that you could uh get in touch with him and and learn more about ways to to engage with him and the team. Uh really appreciate your time, Liam. Thank you, Saul. Great chatting. Hey!